This is TSMC, the company that makes modern life possible. Inside this building, world-class engineers form the building blocks necessary for the advanced electronics we've come to depend on, semiconductors. Without semiconductors, your car wouldn't run, your iPhone wouldn't light up, your dishwasher would sit idle. These tiny chips make life-saving medical devices like implantable pacemakers and insulin pumps a reality for millions of people. Today, if it has an on button, there's a good chance it has a chip inside. And there's also a good chance TSMC made that chip. The company produces over half of the world's chips at 18 factories called fabs, but it makes an astounding 90% of the most sophisticated chips required for rapidly advancing technologies. When it comes to cutting edge semiconductors, no one comes close to TSMC. Not Intel, not Samsung, not Qualcomm. TSMC is in a class of its own. Last year, it brought in over $75 billion in revenue. That's great for TSMC and its 70,000 employees, but the company's unchallenged dominance poses a big problem for the United States. The solution to that problem is part of a multi-industry megatrend that we're following here at Malden Economics. The United States is TSMC's biggest market. It's also home to TSMC's biggest customer, Apple. The California-based tech behemoth accounts for 23% of TSMC's revenue. And the problem, as you may have guessed, is that TSMC is not a U.S. company. Far from it. TSMC is shorthand for Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. And as the name suggests, it's headquartered on the island of Taiwan, which sits 6,800 miles away from U.S. shores, where the East China Sea and the South China Sea converge in the Pacific. If you wanted to visit TSMC's headquarters, you would need to take a 14-hour flight from Los Angeles. Even worse, Taiwan is just about 100 miles off the coast of mainland China. The real kicker is that Taiwan may or may not be an independent nation, depending on who you ask. Taiwan says it is. China says it's part of China. And that leaves the U.S. in a vulnerable position. As one national security leader put it, given that the vast majority of cutting-edge chips are produced at a single plant separated by just 110 miles of water from our principal strategic competitor, we must reevaluate the meaning of supply chain resilience. Now, Americans got a taste of what that supply chain chaos could look like during the pandemic. At one point, 109 container ships lingered outside the ports of LA and Long Beach. Consumers waited up to six months for their new cars to arrive, and companies measured lost revenue in the billions. Add in bad state actors, and our overseas supply chains have the potential to unravel much, much further. Even more concerning, TSMC's proximity to China leaves the U.S. exposed to covert military attacks from its largest and most cunning competitor. A recent independent congressional report summed it up best. If a potential adversary bests the United States in semiconductors over the long term, or suddenly cuts off U.S. access to cutting edge chips entirely, it could gain the upper hand in every domain of warfare. Foreign chip production is not America's only security soft spot. China is far and away the world's top producer of rare earth metals. Last year, its mines accounted for 70% of global production. Rare earth elements are essential for making advanced military equipment, electric vehicle motors, and consumer electronics like smartphones and flat screen TVs. Simply put, the US does not wanna rely on China for rare earths. What happens if China turns off that spigot? China is also home to the world's most prolific electric vehicle battery maker, CATL, which controls a full third of the global market. China produces over half of the world's steel and controls almost 80% of the world's production of polysilicon, an essential component for solar panels. China is the world's largest producer of wheat and rice, even beer. It's alarming to think that in recent years, the world has relied on China for 29%
of all manufacturing output. And this put the United States in a vulnerable position. When COVID-19 hit, that vulnerability was on full display. At the same time, Russia's war in Ukraine has underscored the perils of relying on the opposition for critical resources. Now, for once, the U.S. government seems to be paying attention. It's putting up hundreds of billions of dollars to fortify U.S. supply chains and end U.S. dependence on Chinese manufacturing. This is carving a path for investors eager to profit from the return of manufacturing to U.S. soil. And that's the part of this story that I'm most excited about. But before we dig in more, you should understand how the U.S. got into this predicament. America used to make the stuff that it bought. And then in the 1970s, U.S. companies began moving manufacturing overseas. Cars, clothes, steel, electronics, they could all be made for less somewhere else. And this devastated large swaths of America. Factories shut down. Jobs disappeared. Whole towns crumbled as companies like General Motors left and took the paychecks with them. This process is called offshoring, and it accelerated in the 1980s as China opened up its economy and sent hundreds of millions of impoverished farm workers into Chinese factories. At this point, most of these workers were basically destitute. In the early 1980s, China's per capita income was one third of sub-Saharan Africa. A worker in Ohio wanted a salary that could buy a modest home. A worker in China was happy just to buy food. And U.S. companies took note. They moved production where labor was cheap. Rapid advances in telecommunications and the proliferation of the Internet in the 1990s turbocharged offshoring. Executives no longer had to rely on fax machines or snail mail to communicate with middle management overseas. And by 2010, China was the world's top manufacturing country. And along the way, the U.S. relegated its dominant position in semiconductor manufacturing to Asia. What could go wrong? Turns out, a lot. And that brings us back to today, when the U.S. government is now funneling big money, over $900 billion by our count, to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. It started with the bipartisan Chips and Science Act of 2022. This is infrastructure. This landmark law is pushing $50 billion into U.S.-based chip production. As we speak, TSMC is busy building two production plants in Arizona. There have been some hiccups getting them up and running, but the U.S. government's deep pockets are supporting the process every step of the way. This is why the great reshoring is unstoppable. Today, everyone sees that bringing critical supply chains back home is essential to our national security. The great reshoring isn't limited to chips. My team and I are following pharmaceutical companies, electric vehicle manufacturers, medical device producers, textile companies, even beverage companies. This megatrend is touching almost every industry, and the list of companies we're watching keeps growing. When reshoring in the U.S. is impractical, or when labor costs get in the way, companies are opting to nearshore to places like Mexico, where labor is ultra cheap, trade relations are great, and the transportation of goods is convenient. You might be surprised to learn that Mexico now has the second cheapest labor costs in the world, right behind India. China doesn't even rank in the top five for cheap labor anymore. Today, it's number seven. Mexico just became the United States' number one trading partner. U.S. workers still demand a higher paycheck, but our research shows that even high U.S. labor costs will become less of a barrier. And that's because of rapid advances in automation and artificial intelligence that are allowing innovative U.S. companies to better manage labor costs, helping them produce right here on U.S. soil, closer to their end buyers without hurting their balance sheets. So what about the resources that the U.S. lacks? We're a big country, but we don't have everything. That's why this megatrend also includes friendshoring to places like India. India offers companies the absolute cheapest manufacturing in the world. There's a reason why Apple plans to move 18% of its production to India by 2025. Cheap labor, a reasonably friendly government, ample natural resources, a large, young labor pool. As Apple's CEO Tim Cook said, 
I'm very, very bullish and very, very optimistic about India. If you're an investor, you're probably asking yourself, how can I be a part of this? It's not as simple as investing in companies moving production back to the US because reshoring alone won't automatically boost a company's stock price. Some of the ideas we're looking at include select industrial real estate investment trusts and the companies automating US factories to keep their costs down. We're talking about companies like Rockwell Automation, Honeywell, Stag Industrial, they're all on our watch list. Now, they're not recommendations. These are just examples of the types of companies that might benefit from this trend. There will be winners and losers with reshoring. Overseas container shipping companies are going to struggle, while North American railroads could see new demand. The friend shoring aspect of this trend might mean investing in foreign companies or even broad-based country ETFs. Just look at what happened to the stock market in Mexico and even Vietnam in the past year. Here's the point. This is a multi-year, multi-industry mega trend that my research team and I are following. And if you're an investor, you should too. To hear more about reshoring, the investment opportunities it's generating, and other big macro investment ideas, please subscribe to my free weekly letter and video series at globalmacroupdate.com. There's a link in the description. I'm Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics. Thank you for joining me for this special edition of Global Macro Update.